Let me start with uh, Mr. Stefan Nutter. Would you please raise your arm so that we know who you are? Mr. Stefan Nutter, that is the one with the red tie. He is uh, giving us a sign. He represents his Romanian home country in the European Parliament, and uh, he works in the uh, Budgetary Committee and the Public Health Committee. And before he was uh, elected uh, to the European Parliament, he was an economic scientist. and. Uh, he I was also working in Washington and Addis Abeba. Ilka Zami, uh, so that is uh, him. Uh, he represents the European Commission. He is the Director of Disaster Preparedness and uh, Prevention in the Gen Director General uh, Red, uh, for the European Civil Protection and Humanitarian Aid Operation, DG ECHO, EU Civil Servant and uh, Lawyer. Don't take me wrong, Mr. Salmi. It might sound a little bit uh, boring, but if I told you that he was previously dealing with a spy with spying in the Finnish uh, uh, intelligence service, and he is our James Bond. Mr. Auer, so let me introduce him to you now. We met him earlier morning, uh, dancing with the elephants. That was the key word with him in his uh, the Badgastein European Health Forum, the Davos of the European Health uh, Care as a meet there. That's since an interdisciplinary uh, conference of uh, the WHO and the Austrian Ministry of Health. And, uh, and Dr. Auer is the special envoy of that, and he is also in charge of the European Corona Red Light, Dr. Auer. He is not, as you might think, a medical doctor, but he is a philosopher and a political scientist, and obviously you chose everything right when you selected your uh, job. So I welcome everybody who is here. To your left, Dr. Tangrit Stöbe. Since 2015, he is a member of the International Board of uh, Médecins Sans Frontières. Before that, he was eight years the president of the German branch. I think uh, sometimes it sounds like profession, but uh, he is an intensivist uh, and emergency doctor, and it was uh, just by chance that he got to this international uh, assistance organization following the advice of a friend and he helped people which were under um, supplied and uh, he was also um, honored with the Paracelsus medal. Do you also have that uh, Dr. Gassen? So the Paracelsus medal. You must not say that. Often there are elderly colleagues who are distinguished and get this medal. But, uh, well, Mr. Stöwisch, he is still pretty, pretty uh, young. So this was uh, uh, quite frank. Mr. Gassen would like to get this uh, award only in five, 15 years from now. So Dr. Gassen, so he is the CEO of the KBV, and he is also a, a physician, and he is our experienced host. I'm looking forward to hear about uh, international perspectives and prospects. And Stefan, Mr. Stefan Nuta, I would like to start with you. Romania, I read that it was not that uh, heavily affected by corona. Now there is an increase in infections. How does the Romanian health system uh, cope with this? We want to talk about the international situation. By the way, the tie is great. Thank you very much. <laughs> and thanks uh, for your invitation. I, it would be a pleasure for me to be at Bad Gastein. So the city of Franz Schubert, I envy you for, for uh, being there and for organi uh, organizing this uh, wonderful summit. I will speak uh, from now on in English because this is how I prepared for this meeting. Uh, I was looking recently at the numbers for the Spanish flu and some uh, detail that somebody see, uh, all seemed to, to ignore perhaps is that the strength of the second and the third waves were more significant than the first in the case of the Spanish flu. Now I know that it's not easily comparable to COVID-19, but somehow we all assume that because we did confinement in the spring, the worst was behind us and it 
not necessarily so. You have noticed it also in Austria that it wasn't easy to, to reopen when you did it in May. Uh, the same is in Romania. Reopening did not come sufficiently with a message that uh, relaxation means testing, means being prepared, means uh, social distancing. Relaxation is not, uh, we are, you know, we took a break from the, the virus. Now, I'm, I'm not pleased with the way things are going in my, my home country. We are at over 2,000 cases a day now, but I'm also not pleased entirely of how the European reaction looked like. And when I say the European reaction, I mean the ministers, I mean the council of ministers, because as you all know, I'm sure, health is not yet a shared competence of the EU, uh, and therefore is more of an intergovernmental affair. That's why in August, together with my colleague Veronique Trier Lemar, who's a champion of health policy and oncologist, we wrote a letter to Commissioner, to the President of Commission von der Leyen, together with our uh, boss, with the Dacian Cholos, the chief of the Renew Europe Group, and we said, we cannot let the European people down. They have high expectations that we will manage the second wave properly, and we demanded more harmonization, more common screening, common uh, light, um, uh, sorry, the, the headlight system, the ampel, I don't know how to exactly call it in English. And uh, we demanded for political action to be taken between the council. We have enough expertise, we have enough expert groups. We have the ECDC, that's not what we need. I mean, it's needed, obviously, but we need political decisions so that, for instance, Hungary doesn't close its borders to everyone and then Germany closes its borders to Brussels and Brussels closes its borders to, to Romania, for instance. It's all a mess. We need to have a coordination within the EU. We cannot let the people down. And uh, yeah, that's why we pushed for this common, uh, common approach uh, after the summer and we already had uh, four uh, proposals from uh, that were put forward by the Commission. So we are on track and uh, we health policy members we are here to, to make sure that uh, a common European response exists, that sufficient European money exists with the emergency support uh, instrument, that money for a vaccine and readiness for a European vaccine and a, 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 a vaccination percentage of 40% of the Union's most risky is, is, uh, is applied. So mm -hmm. once again, thank you for inviting me to, to your very esteemed uh, forum. And I look forward to our interesting debate today. Thank you. Thank you. So you took us into the depth of Brussels politics. We come back to that later. Uh, questions of uh, money, of distribution, of funds. Um, but uh, let uh, me put it more generally. Mr. Auer, since the morning you have been dancing with elephants. Why? While we were watching alpacas at the European Health uh, uh, Summit, COVID will also be in the center. Have you learned already something that, he, what, that was surprising to you that you didn't know before? Um, hello, everyone, uh, and happy to be back um, again here on, on this panel. Um, when it comes to COVID, you know, we learn every day. You know, I'm in the, sitting on the crisis, crisis management board in Vienna um, every day, not these days, but every day. So I have learned uh, every day something new because, you know, it's a process. It's a process. There are no, there are no answers. But when we talked about um, uh, dancing with elephants, you know, <clears throat> when we came up with this topic for our conference a year ago, practically, we didn't think about COVID, of course. And, you know, when you talk about COVID, you know, in the European context now, then I think that the elephant in the room is a very, very severe one. And I think, uh, Nicola, you touched it. It is the national fragmentation. That's the elephant when it comes to fighting pandemic situations, or, or health emergencies uh, within Europe, because I think we have best practice solution. I might, uh, you know, in the second uh, second input, I, I might talk about the successes, but I also have to talk about the weaknesses of this elephant, is the fragmentation, the national fragmentation. The key doesn't provide that, and, uh, you know, and as you rightly said, so, you know, it is a, it was painful to see that, uh, that the national governments reacted, I would even say overreacted, 
and that there was not a common understanding how you should deal with it. To be, to be very practical, is a, I think it is a shame, and it still is a shame, and that we discussed here in last time too, that um, we do these travel warnings and, and, and international travel regimes within the European Union on, on numbers which might be accurate when it comes to the region, but we don't even look at the numbers, you know, how they have an influence on, on my own country. What do I want to say? You know, if, if a certain region in Europe has an incidence rate of, let's say, 50 to in seven days to 100,000, you know, I don't have only to look at that number. I have to examine, you know, has that an influence on my own infection situation or pandemic situation in my own country? You know, I have to be very careful as an Austrian because the issue was a super spreading event, but we have left that behind and we are doing so much better now. You know what I'm saying here? There is no common understanding within the European Union about all this travel regime, this travel warnings. This is painful. I can't even, I can't even tell how painful it is because it is, it is epidemiologically, it's not very useful, but economically, it's a disaster because it's breaking down the tourist industry, the travel industry, but not only this one. So it is really not a good example for an international mm -hmm. collaboration, but I wouldn't even say international collaboration, but a collaboration within the European Union. You wish to see more coherence, and this coherence, well, it is not in existence that much. Looking at the European bodies, Mr. Gassen, looking at Brussels, uh, uh, Strasbourg, we see a heavy struggle between the Council and the Parliament uh, when it comes to the funds, how much uh, money is made available. Uh, EU for Health, it is about improving the uh, health of uh, EU citizens and to strengthen systems to promote innovations. These are noble goals, 9.4 billion were uh, dedicated, but uh, this has now been uh, reduced to 1.4 billion, and there's a still a fight about that. Uh, how do you consider this and the reduction? This is also a matter of uh, coherence. Well, uh, it is uh, important to, to see um, uh, if you are faced with uh, COVID-19 everywhere in all fields of life and the European Union that wish to be a powerful body uh, has a, a first thing, uh, to, nothing else to do but reducing a health budget uh, of more than 9 billion to uh, 1.7 billion. This is hard to understand. Um, and uh, that is just one thing, one side of the coin. The European Union is for us important, and of course, uh, these are our closest neighbors uh, that we like most of all. But uh, uh, the rest of the world is acting even more erratically. Uh, the first uh, country where uh, the first patients occurred uh, um, had a declared the pandemic uh, um, to be over and uh, some some erratic figures were mentioned. Russia has created a vaccine for them. Uh, this is also the end of the story. The Americans, um, they have their own way of uh, dealing with this uh, topic of corona and we are in midst of this uh, hotbed of tension. But actually we are dependent on all of these uh, players and that makes it all the more difficult and therefore I guess it would be appropriate and wise if uh, Europe uh, as such uh, tries to develop a joint strategy. Uh, actually, I do not really see it. Uh, as Germans, uh, we have always had a hard life uh, in the past. Whenever I visited Brussels and whenever we wanted to communicate what our health system is because the way we have it in Germany with uh, our corporate bodies, uh, subsidiarity principle, etc. For many countries, this is completely unknown. 
And these are additional aspects coming in. That is to say, we do not understand each other's health systems, and I think there is no general understanding of how, at a European level, one could act or should act. So the German EU Council presidency is at, uh, going on right now. There is a lot of uncertainty. You wish to get a joint strategy. We heard from Stefan Nutter that the, a that they, we are missing a so Mr. I was missing a common understanding. So, echo you, you Mr. Salmi, uh, your GD is uh, responsible for the crisis management. Would you say that it was working well there, or do you also need? Uh, uh, is there a need for action? Is there space for improvement? Maybe you can tell us. Uh, how this uh, um, crisis intervention mechanism works. It does not only exist since uh, cor corona has uh, erupted. How does it work? First of all, thank you so much for having this opportunity to address you uh, today with these issues. And indeed, when I discuss on behalf of the European Commission, this is mainly from the DG ECHO's point of view, the civil protection and, let's say, the first respond elements of these issues. Our colleagues in DG Sante, the health colleagues, are, of course, are working on many other uh, strands and streams of activities as we, as we speak, vaccine strategy being one of those. If, I, if you allow me, just very, very rapidly, I would like to run through what did we do over the last months from, from DG Echo's point of view, and then get back to your question on what were the lessons learned and, and how could we improve the, the cooperation that we, that we have and, and how would we address, uh, be it the pandemic or other type of a disaster which would, would uh, have an impact on the, on the whole EU and all the member states. So basically, to kick off with, the, the, uh, firstly, what we did see through this Union Civil Protection Mechanism was an unprecedented number of requests from, not only from the EU member states, but also from, especially from, from the neighboring regions, to address the challenges that they had with, 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 with this pandemic, COVID-19. We did receive 52 requests, which is, an, as I said, an unprecedented number. It basically reflects the requests uh, uh, in the normal circumstances, we would receive 50 requests around two or three years. So clearly, what first thing that we tried to do, and, and, and this is also clearly one of the first shortcomings that we realized, is that when we have a situation which affects all the member states simultaneously, this union civil protection mechanism is actually not, not necessarily fit to, to, to address such a situation, as the mechanism's main idea is that it would be assistance from member states to those member states who are affected, but if you have a situation where everyone is affected simultaneously, then of course things get difficult. And I'll, I'll come back to that, how we try to address this uh, in the coming, hopefully in the coming uh, weeks and months. Again, just to point out what we did, I mean, we did repatriate around 82,000 EU citizens uh, together with the member states. Um, one of the, I would say, most massive operations, uh, peacetime operations that we have had, and, and unhelpful, uh, I would imagine, for many. Thirdly, we, we are hosting what we call a mobility package now, which is basically assisting the member states to, to transport uh, medical supplies, medical goods, medical teams if needed, or patients from one, one member state to another, or from, from outside the EU to the Union, especially when it's about the cargo transportation. So we did play a role and tried to assist the member states, and this activity is going on. We have 220 million euros reserved, and we have basically spent the big part of that already. And fourth, we did have also actions outside the European Union, which was the so-called uh, humanitarian air bridge, where we tried it to contribute for the uh, transport of humanitarian aid and medical teams, for example, to those regions, uh, specifically in Africa, which were hit and where uh, assistance was needed. And now to your question about the, you know, what were the shortcomings? I already pointed out, I would say, the most significant one. The mechanism did not, uh, well, probably not set up for a situation where all the member states are affected. So this was clearly the, the, the issue. It has also, of course, this pandemic has demonstrated that the national capacities alone were insufficient to, to respond to those needs. 
and, uh, and that's, 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 that's important because actually in our system, we are the, let's say, the, if not the last resort, we are the backup mechanism, or we should be the backup mechanism. The national responsibility is, of course, and they are in the first line, and then only if they have exhausted all their means, we should step in, and in this case, and coordinate the ac ac actions uh, in, in, in that. So one thing which is now the, the on, on top of our agenda, which means that we would need to do some legislative changes, is to come up with an EU-level stockpiling, for example, for, for medical, be it medical goods or be it, uh, personal protective equipment, so that we would have really a backup if we would face a similar situation, be it a pandemic, as I said, or some other sort of a crisis. Initially, we have been working together with Germany and, and Romania, and now, only as of last week, we have four other member states who have joined us in this project. And what does this practically mean? It means that these member states are acquiring purchasing equipment in accordance with, our, um, with, with us, basically, and we will finance then the member states for the purchase, the maintenance, and the transportation. Just to give you a practical example for this, all famous uh, BBF2 and BBF3 masks, for example, we now have a stockpile, and if there is a need, I would say a significant stockpile, if there is a need, we could then provide these masks to another member mm -hmm. state, or to one of the member states. May I interrupt you? I'm sorry, Mr. Sami, but we are going to come back to uh, specific things uh, in a minute. Mr. Stube. So, so indeed, so just, I, I finished off by just by saying that what we're trying to do now on the uh, uh, legislative front is indeed to enable us to, to um, uh, indeed to have a more, let's say, a significant role when need be and when the mem all the member states are, are affected so that the union would have a role to play. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you very much. You made it clear that there are many challenges uh, and uh, we are one of the uh, richest regions in the world, Dr. Stube. Uh, Médecins Sans Frontières uh, is committed uh, in many countries that have existential uh, concerns, uh, even without corona. Recently you were in Yemen. Are there any uh, possibilities for people who are suffering from war? Can they protect themselves from a pandemic? Uh, Mrs. Samrotsky, the short answer is no. And as you said, well, um, we say that in Yemen there's one of the biggest humanitarian crises of the world uh, and uh, people actually uh, did not want to uh, recognize that there is a virus. Um, it was officially only identified on the 10th of April and having a look at the official numbers uh, from WHO for Yemen, there are 2,000 infected and 580 people fatalities. Um, interestingly enough, uh, this is uh, a similar question that uh, Médecins Sans Frontières have also tested uh, uh, in Yemen and had also to accompany while uh, deceasing. So having a look at the country, the entire north, that is to say where the uh, majority of the population lives, uh, there is no testing done because there is officially no COVID and that shows uh, and tells you something. It is if, in, if you would only screen the North Sea coast in Germany. So there's a civil war, but uh, it said that there was no pandemic. Uh, but interestingly enough, it is not that easy to find out about these uh, stories. It took me quite a while. But my interest in this pandemic uh, was very intensive even when I got there. And indeed, uh, of course, there was no prevention, no prediction. There was no information of the population from the very outset. There was a major fear and stigmatization. There were no hospitals uh, that uh, admitted uh, patients with COVID symptoms. Uh, those who wanted to get in, they were rejected. I met a patient, a lady. She tried three times uh, to be admitted to hospital, but then she was rejected. And then uh, she was uh, accepted and admitted 
admitted uh, to the only one and to the newly built uh, COVID uh, hospital in uh, June. She had a very, very poor uh, oxygen saturation, and then we had to uh, ventilate her for five uh, weeks, uh, which was uh, difficult because they don't have an oxygen supply. Uh, every hour we had to transport oxygen there. Logistically, this was very challenging, very demanding, and the most striking uh, number of COVID-19 in uh, Yemen is mortality, and it is really the world record, which is about almost 30 percent. Uh, this is also due to the fact that there's too little testing done, but also in our clinics we had a mortality rate of almost 60 percent, and that is almost close to Ebola. Ebola. Uh, that's to say this it shows that the country was not prepared. People were completely uh, scared, and they still are. And there are no masks, no face masks. There is no protection. There are no hospitals that would be equipped for that. And that is to say, for a chronic uh, uh, five-year uh, civil war crisis, there was this uh, pandemic getting on top right now. The figures are going down. That might be somewhat reassuring. But looking forward and uh, also seeing what is happening in Europe, that COVID is coming back, I'm as much as concerned as I was in those days. The EU, they have uh, um, values, they strive for the uh, the stars, they are symbolizing the values, and so far it is also a challenge for the EU outside uh, also outside uh, its borders. Mr. Auer, we talked about testing. Let us now come to talk about the more hopeful uh, subject of um, vaccination and vaccine strategies. Uh, with the distribution of vaccines, uh, you have a particular uh, role to play within Europe and beyond. You are the chair of the uh, steering group of uh, the distribution of uh, vaccines. How does it work? And do you also look at countries outside the EU? So, Mr. Auer, we cannot we cannot hear you, but uh, your finger, we saw your finger <laughs> pointing. Uh, okay. Uh, thank, thank you very you. much for this question, because this, this is, is a success, a success story, a true European success, success story I can, I can tell you about. Because, you know, in June it took, uh, it was, of course, uh, the, uh, the, the early shadows of the German presidency already, um, but, um, you know, it was, uh, it, it took us not very long, the 27 governments, to agree that we do uh, all the procurement for the COVID vaccines jointly as a group of 27 and not separately by each and every, each and every member state. And, um, and we, that was, for me, you know, and as you see in my beard, you know, I'm quite an old guy, but, you know, that was, for me, surprisingly fast, you know, uh, and, and there was no lawyer talk and no talk about subsidiarity and blah, 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 you know, all this. And we agreed very quickly, with, together with the Commission, and, uh, and now there we are. You know, in mid June we started this process. I have the privilege uh, on the side of the member states to, to co-chair this process together with my uh, dear colleague from Lichy Santé, Sandra Galina, who is a tough woman um, uh, in, the, in the Commission. And we have a joint negotiation team uh, consisting of uh, representatives of the member states and, and, and the commission. And they're doing a wonderful job in, in, in negotiating contracts now, pre-purchasing or advanced purchasing agreements with, uh, with uh, 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 producers. We also have, you know, we, we have found a strategy, you know, we're doing it under the circumstances of risk sharing. And we have, um, we have seven uh, uh, producers now which we are uh, trying to uh, uh, make uh, contracts. You know, we have already two in the pocket, and the others are uh, 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 shortly before uh, finishing. Uh, and this is a shared portfolio. It is a risk-sharing portfolio. It has it conta entails all the different technologies which are able, uh, which are uh, available on the market. You know, the, the, the novel ones, the mRNA. Uh, uh, vaccines, but also the, the, the vector-based and the protein-based uh, vaccines, so that we have a that we have uh, that we have a risk shared risk, you know, because we don't know, you know, today October first, you know, nobody has an answer which uh, vaccines really will make it through the market authorization, 
and, um, and, 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 and that's what it is. We also put quite a bit of money on the table, you know, because the Commission has, uh, has staffed this so-called ASIA, this Emergency Support Initiative. There were a little bit over 2 billion euros for the, for the, for the pre-purchasing, for the down payments, you want to say. And we, the member states, have topped it up now with another 750 million euros. So there is a substantial amount of money for financing this, uh, this, this down payment. Why is that so important? And that's also a global thing, you know, and sometimes we, we are not talking about the good things Europe is doing also globally. Because all this money we are now putting on the table for the down payments is money which is going to these companies and, and they are capable to beef up their production, production capacities. That because that's the most important thing, that the companies are capable of producing these billions and billions and billions of doses as we need worldwide. Yes, of course, with these contracts we are in the, in the, in the ideal phase that all these seven, uh, seven producers make it through market authorization. In this, in this ideal situation we will have 1.4 billion, a little bit more, a billion doses is for the European market, for us European citizens, but you can figure out, you know, Europe never, the European Union never would need this 1.4 billion doses, and that would, we would donate that. Uh, this is also our part when it comes to the global initiative, this COVAX facility, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric and confusion, but, you know, on the global level, there's this very, very similar mechanism going on, shared by Gavi and by WHO and SEPI, um, but, but they are much slower than we are in the European Union because we, we you know, from mid-June until now we have all this done and, and almost completed. Thank you. We are participating also in the COVAX facility. The European Union is providing their substantial funding, plus, you know, the big advantage for the rest of the world that we invested so heavily into production capacity so that we will have enough vaccines mm -hmm. also for the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. It sounds a little bit like what uh, Mr. Spahn said when uh, he said that uh, if, we, uh, if we have something that we don't need, then uh, we're happy to give it uh, to somebody else. So I would like to dive a little deeper into this one. How do you speak about this in the European Parliament? Do you think that you can reach a uh, just distribution within Europe? And how do you feel as a parliamentarian? Are you especially responsible for the member states? Or do you, do you think beyond uh, that? And uh, do you think also in other regions in Asia, in Asia or Africa? I assume the question is addressed to me? Yes. Okay. Shall I repeat? You. No. Here, here, my name. Uh, definitely, the just distribution of the vaccine is one of the main topics of discussion. We had a discussion last week with the European Commission in, in which I think 80% of my colleagues said, well, that's all good, 40% vaccination rate in the European Union, but how about the rest of the world? How about COVAX, etc.? The other point that was raised was how do we ensure transparency of these uh, pre-purchases um, agreements? Uh, because this is, and I said very easily, public money, public rules. This is not business as usual. We need to be very transparent about our deals, even if it includes you know, private companies and perhaps even uh, medical uh, secrets. Nevertheless, this is public money, public rules. We need to be very transparent about the European purchases. Uh, so, when I said, this was just an introduction to tell you that uh, fair distribution for the entire world population is a big concern of the Union. However, if we look at the situation before the crisis and the situation after, I am personally very proud that the European Union came with 2.7 billion euros for emergency support uh, instruments. Without this money, we wouldn't be even talking about vaccines and vaccine development uh, in Europe because you need, for, for this kind of research, you need a push from the public sector. We even have this in the UK, a country that is more used to, let's say, private funding, etc. Even there, 
the research that is conducted in King's College and, and elsewhere is fund, funded, uh, funded publicly in great, great amounts. Uh, my, uh, the previous uh, speaker, Mr. Salmi, uh, also mentioned what they're doing at the level of the commission. I was at the forefront of making sure we put money aside to have stockpiles. On 3rd of March, we had an amendment in the European Parliament amending the regulation for UCPN, including permanent stockpiles, and that was rejected, if you can believe it. As far as 3 March, it took the Commission a few other weeks to come with an implementing act and solve the issue. So, you know, sometimes as politicians, we, we are not far-sighted enough, and I, I wish to, to, to see, to make policy for the future, not for the present, or the past. And, and for me, the permanent stockpiles is a big, big component of that. Regardless of what you might think ideologically, I think as Europe, as a continent, we need to have a permanent stockpile, and I will fight with the nail for it, including for the EU for Health program that you mentioned, that was cut from 9.4 to 1.7 billion. Uh, this was a message that was also taken on board by Stella Kirakides. We are here to to make sure that the European public is well served and well, well uh, protected. I think mm -hmm. that's our job uh, in the first place. And also as citizens of the world, because it's a public pandemic, we also have an obligation towards the rest of the world to make it as accessible uh, as possible and also to increase perhaps the funding we give. I believe the funding we give uh, around the world right now is 80 billion. Uh, but, but much more is needed. I believe uh, uh, there was a calculation that only a few, uh, a few millions of doses would pay for, for, mm -hmm. for this money that we have for uh, development aid at the moment. I mean, for the vaccine for the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Stefanuta. You said uh, we are not far-sighted enough, so that brings uh, James Bond back into the game. Mr. Salmi, uh, this is what is on your list of tasks in your organization, being foresighted. Ja, ihr Mikro bitte. Danke. Ich vergesse es auch immer, wenn ich zu Hause selber drücken muss. So indeed, my apologies. I, I might have missed part of the question, but I, I think actually we come to the very, very relevant question here, which is indeed the foresight. How do we look and how do we see the future and, and whether we would have a system which would be, first of all, wide-ranging enough also from the, from the European Union point of view, and what would be the mechanisms that from an early warning we can guarantee that we actually take early uh, from early warning into an early action. That's, that's the key, key question. We have been lucky. I mean, the proposal now on the table for the finances uh, would, would give us uh, for the next seven years an amount of 3.1 billion euros if that goes forward. So at least we would have the financial means to be, to be there. I also would like to point out that President von der Leyen and our Commissioner, Mr. Lenacic, has been very strongly advocating for evidence-based policymaking and, and indeed a kind of an anticipatory governance uh, um, in, 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 in her mandate. So this is clearly something where we would need to, to, to go forward. And there are two things that I just want to highlight very quickly. The other one is that we would need, and this is something which the Council and the European Parliament has encouraged us to, to look into, is the, uh, uh, let's say, a modern revised crisis management system for the, for the Union, and that's absolutely needed, which would, as I said, need to be a wide-ranging, um, bringing in and bringing together all the actors not only within, within the Commission, of course, but more widely in the EU and, and together with the member states. That's the, that's the clear starting point. And I think we have ambitions there and, and hopefully that, that could go forward quickly. The second point that we would need is resilience. And what we have also proposed um, as DG ECHO in our tabled draft is, is an, what we would call the resilience goals for, for Europe, which would basically mean that we would all look into the, the, the mechanism that would allow all the member states to have a certain, certain set standards. This is very much a, a work in progress and a discussion with the member states whether and how we could do that. But I truly believe that with these two elements, uh, the crisis management system, which would include the foresight and the prediction parts, uh, indeed, due to my background, I know that sometimes it's very complicated, um, also to, to come up with the right prediction, but more importantly, how you translate that into an actionable um, information. That's also one of the key, 
key elements. And in that respect, um, uh, the Commission has come up very recently, a couple of weeks ago, with a uh, kind of first foresight report, which is helpful to put these aspects into, into a play. And, and then, then indeed, indeed building on the resilience goals. This, this is now where we are, and hopefully that will also play into the um, understanding better the future and also being better prepared, uh, be it a pandemic or any other type of major disaster that we might face in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a hope we all share. Mr. Gassen, in Germany also, uh, we did have some bottlenecks in uh, terms of medicines. So uh, what would a uh, good uh, medicine strategy look like, be it German, uh, European or international? So we've learned that it's uh, problematic that uh, when we depend as a European Union on other countries in uh, our supply chains, Mm, and on one uh, specific uh, country, and in the the um, uh, PPE, it was uh, China specifically. So that's a lesson we learned in Europe that we uh, need to regain an independence. We used to be the pharmacy of the world, and uh, now we have to make sure uh, that uh, we can uh, again depend on ourselves. And it's uh, it's very sad that uh, we depend, as I said, on on China for for, for these very basic uh, products, and. Uh, and it's uh, really not worth it. Not the, the the money we save is not worth it because uh, with uh, these equipments uh, we can save lives, and that's what counts. So uh, there were really very dramatic uh, scenes uh, on on airports, and uh, the the equipment uh, boxes were loaded, unloaded, and uh, there were there were. Uh, boxes of of money mm, being given to uh, to people, so we do owe the European Union and uh, their people that in times of emergency we are able to produce our own medicines. I think uh, that's something that uh, is necessary. Other um, otherwise, we are not even able to help other people. Of course, if I look at the situation in Yemen, it's dramatic. And uh, we have had inquiries from other countries too, so we don't have anything. And so uh, PPE-wise and uh, talking about a vaccine, whether or not we will have a vaccine by the end of the year, it, it, it probably yes, but how many dosages? That's a question. Maybe a couple of millions. And uh, then uh, we will have a certain amount of vaccines uh, which will be distributed over Europe according to population, according uh, to uh, the precariousness of uh, the situation in any given country, according to risk groups and infections. So we were really quite naive when uh, we uh, observed these key industries to go uh, to go elsewhere. And now we're at the end of uh, the, the supply chain. And uh, we promised uh, uh, that we would leave no one behind as the uh, world community. But you very realistically say now, so let's see how many vaccines we will have. And uh, then, uh, Mr. Stöber, do you have any realistic plans how a, a strategy or how a supply uh, with medicines of um, uh, every state uh, can uh, be devised. Yes. COVID-19 is interesting in uh, so far as it's a global phenomenon and it is being tackled with very differently in, in the countries, in the different uh, continents and and regions. We, we've seen that in these few months so we've seen distribution mr our you said we don't have we won't have enough dosages even for the european union if we calculate realistically as a humanitarian physician and doctor of course i'm very worried because what we've seen so far once we have a vaccine will will repeat itself or even worse 
uh, we can see now that the wealthy nations, including Germany, including the EU, have um, secured uh, their dosages, which is, of course, understandable given the amount of, uh, of their populations. But uh, we, we don't want to leave anyone behind, is what we said and pledged isn't it? And uh, we al always deal with publicly financed uh, research projects. So billions of euros are going into these uh, d this development of uh, the vaccine. And uh, we uh, may observe that uh, they uh, will be used to um, uh, to uh, produce the uh, profit for the pharmaceutical companies in Europe. And um, it is not very likely that all the developments are going to be successful. All five candidates uh, will uh, end up being a vaccine. Even then, two-thirds of the world population will have to wait two or three more years before they get the vaccine. And uh, we are at the end. We know that uh, we this year we won't have a vaccine. Maybe next year. So, what uh, um, the, the the one thing we have the longest time to agree uh, amongst each other the uh, the vaccine. Even that isn't uh, going to work. So we are really extremely worried. The uh, the German government. Um, has uh, t uh, bought shares in two companies. You can discuss that, of course. It's disputable. So uh, they are certainly not going to use those dosages that are going to produce with these uh, companies for humanitarian reasons. So we need to define uh, clear humanitarian objectives, and uh, this cannot depend on uh, national interests or uh, on who uh, whoever is uh, the wealthiest. So. Who organizes that? The uh, uh, WHO, the UN. The WHO has a uh, has uh, agreed on the framework, and it sounds well from our point of view. Uh, but the question is whether it will be implemented, and uh, we're very worried indeed. Uh, we need a fair access. We need a fair distribution of these vaccines. And we're very skeptical once we will have a vaccine. So I'm uh, looking at the person who is observing the chat. Uh, looking at the chat, is there anything? May Are there I any questions? May I come in here very quick? Uh, I didn't see it. Wer, wer spricht da gerade? Herr Auer, hallo. Can, Can I, come I come in very, very quickly? Bitte. Because we have to, you know, this, this discussion is going in the wrong direction. Is it? You know, I think each and every government within the European Union has a fundamental interest that the European citizens can be covered by COVID vaccines. Because this is of utmost importance. We have three criteria. That's the timely availability, this is the quality of the stuff we are, vaccine, uh, we are producing here, and it's of course also the price. I think the European Union did a wonderful job in, in, in getting all three facts right, because we will have a timely delivery and we will have um, a, a, in a good quality because you know the EMA and the, the market authorization agency will do this, and we will, and we, we were capable of, as because we exercised our market power to bring that down. But this is also a very, very tough negotiation process. And you know, I have to say, and I'm a big friend. I'm sitting on the executive board of WHO. But our friends in Geneva lost time. They don't have the capacity, the capability to do this tough negotiations with the pharmaceutical industry. I don't, I'm, I'm, you know, the, the negotiations are almost over and, you know, I don't want to get into spilled milk, but that was not very easy. And this is also to protect the taxpayers and to protect the, the, the people of the world. And I think the European Union did a wonderful job. You know, my chancellor, and I'm sure that Angela Merkel and all the other heads of states and government see it the same, we do need a substantial amount of vaccines to cover the European interest and to cover the European uh, people. And it's not only about healthcare providers and social workers and the most important risk groups. 
Think about the teachers' union. Think about the other unions who were, 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 the, were where industries will demand vaccines for their people. And yet, then I would like to see the Angela Merkel and the other chancellors and head of state if they say, no, 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 we don't have these vaccines ready. No, 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 no. Please be fair here. This is a very, very crucial question, and we do the utmost for the European Union, but also globally. Thank you. Thank you. So here, expertise and passion has come together here. Mrs. Reisbergwitz, do we have exciting questions? It's almost going to the same direction. Question by Corina Glorios, no, not by a chat member. In English now? Expensive. The vaccine is allowed to be, first question. Then, after all the taxpayers' money has been used to produce it, it should not be sold at incredible high prices to achieve exuberant profits for the company. So actually, I do not know who would be the right uh, addressee. Can you help me, Mr. Gassen? So I can tell you something about the pricing. Uh, I cannot tell you anything about the pricing uh, of uh, pharmaceutical industries. In a perfect world, uh, if uh, taxpayers' money is uh, spent, then the contracts uh, should be uh, developed in such a way that uh, there are certain caps. I, acoustically, I couldn't get it, said the moderator. In an, an ideal world, if you negotiate that, if uh, taxpayers' uh, money is uh, spent, uh, then uh, one should be able to uh, uh, predict prices in some way. I don't know whether this has happened this way. Somebody from our European club, Mr. Stefan Uta. No. So then uh, let's... Uh, Mr. Stefan Uta, okay. Hi. Certainly, I will try to also respond to that question because, as, as I said, said public, public money, public rules. We, we cannot uh, basically subsidize somebody's um, somebody's race for you know incredible profits. Once a vaccine is out, everybody knows that it will be looked and uh, and, and searched by everybody. But I wanted to underline that what Dr. Auer just said is very very important because so far the European Union and the European Commission was damned if they did and damned if they didn't. I think the progress that we have on achieving um, reserves for vaccines, on uh, putting it out on the market, on having calls for development, on having pre-purchase agreements, these are all medical, they're, they're policy innovations. Nothing like this has existed before in the European Union. So we shouldn't forget that this is actually a very good and very precautious and very foretelling uh, way of doing policy. So let's not, uh, you know, let the intricacies of distribution blind us from the fact that this is a good thing that we, we try to protect our citizens uh, uh, in the first line. On the pricing, indeed, those companies that, that will be able to, to develop vaccines will be under severe pressure from the public funding to, to, to keep, uh, to keep the, uh, the profitability at a reasonable amount. That is why we need those contracts to be very transparent and public. Thank you. Thank you. Certainly, there are further questions. Yes, one more by Thomas Rossock in English. Physical proximity. This means that you have to react locally. How can local actors be supported centrally or by the EU. Mm -hmm. Okay, how can local players be supported by the EU? Well, Mr. Auer, maybe, do you want to answer? Sure, I can. Of mm -hmm. course, uh, health... Our, our, our all-purpose weapon, Mr. Auer. Uh, no, no. But, uh, of course, uh, the, the health, health services, services are always, always local or regional, and, and they, they have, have to be organized locally and regionally. And regionally. But, but, you know, there, there, is, there, is, there is something else what we can do on the European level. And I think with in this, uh, on this panel, we already touched upon certain very, very crucial elements. The one thing is, you know, joint procurement. 
Um, and I think the, the best practice example here of uh, the vaccines will also lead into other ideas where we can exercise joint procurement when it comes to high, high uh, uh, innovations because then we can first time exercise our market position and that's that's for the benefit of each and everyone because uh, you know in a fragmented market you know we when i'm 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 the civil servant of a country with roughly nine million people you know we don't have market power germany might have but even, even Germany, Germany has limited market, market power. power. But, but you, you know, know, as the European Union, Union we, we do have market power. power. So, so there we can help locally, locally you know, the, the, the accessibility and the availability, for example, for innovative drugs, when we collaborate better on the, on the European level. Once again, the, you know, the access of innovative, for access to innovative drugs might not be a topic for Germany or Austria, but it is already a, a very, very important topic for our friend in Romania. You know, so, so this is, is, you know, that, that's, that's European, European because when, uh, uh, Mr. Stefanato is a European citizen like me, and, and his constituents are European, European citizens like the people who are paying my salary. salary. So, so I, I think that's that what we should all think about. about. So, so joint, joint procurement, procurement stockpiling, you know, you know organizing, organizing the stupidity of travel bans and travel blocks, etc., etc. Et that's, that's what we can join do jointly on the European level. level. And, and, and we don't, don't have to interfere how a doctor is exercising his treatment and his cure or whatever uh, in his office or how, how, uh, how a hospital is operated. That's not European. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are many, many layers where we really can uh, do something which is beneficial benefiting, benefiting than the, the regional or local level. Okay, vielen Dank. Okay, many thanks. That's to say local action. That also matches the subsidiarity principle of the EU. In conclusion, a difficult task. You are not uh, warned, but you are all very good and uh, deep, uh, deeply involved in this question. So we do not only want to have strong health systems in the year 2020, but also uh, for the future, not only in Germany and in Europe, but uh, globally. The very difficult task to you, please. Uh, you would uh, make a uh, advertising poster together, and you say what you need for that. Mr. Auer, please start with that as well. You have said so many good things. What would be your buzzword, your ma magical word, in order to have a strong, resilient health systems? You, you know, know uh, putting you know, the buzzword one is uh, word. Maybe dancing with Dancing with the Elephant. Jetzt kann ich schon Ihre Lippe lesen. Dankeschön. Dancing with the Elephant. So I can read your lips now. So you said uh, Dancing with the Elephant. That's great. So Mr. Stefan Uta, he's smiling. He uh, looks uh, relaxed. Therefore, I'm asking you as the next one. So it is nice to I watch somebody again, I, thinking. I once again, I once again concur with Dr. Auer. Uh, I think today's uh, debate was the clear uh, show of the fact that somebody who's an expert can also be an excellent politician and uh, that we need both these parts in the discussion. We need politics as much as we need expertise in this. And what is your word uh, for the poster? Politics? Why not? I would say you're, uh, uh, a union of health. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Many thanks. So, Mr. Salmi. Next. Thank you. I would absolutely go for, for either solidarity or, or mutual assistance. That might be the way, way forward and also a good foresight. So foresight and solidarity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Stübe, what is your word? I must confess, well, it's, may I also use five words? One is not enough. Mr. Auer, I have to contradict to what you said. I do understand your Eurocentric view, but I think this pandemic, uh, particularly for us, the rich Europeans, we need to look beyond uh, the borders That's of our I continent. Um, uh, that is five words, fair access, uh, fair and just distribution of vaccines once they're there, clear priority. Uh, the the health uh, professionals have to be uh, vaccinated first worldwide, not only in Europe. We can protect, but in most countries of the world, uh, poor people cannot protect.
protect themselves. They don't have any protection material. Third word is uh, um, people in humanitarian uh, crisis areas, uh, refugees, uh, uh, people in um, war regions uh, and uh, the increase of uh, COVID uh, vaccines, but independently of licenses. Here we have to break with uh, uh, principles of the pharmaceutical industries and uh, transparency is the last word uh, uh, of the development of pharmaceuticals, transparency. Okay, so you actually violate, violated the rules uh, horribly, but uh, the only excuse for that is that you represent the majority of the world popula population, Mr. Stube. Mr. Gassen, one word, you are the host, uh, you, may, uh, you may mention three. What did you say? Look, good, good luck. We will need good luck. So that's nice. So it was also uh, good luck to be able to listen to you. We are also very happy that you listen to us. And I'm uh, curious now to find out how Mrs. Reisbergowitz, who gave us such a nice introduction at the beginning of this day, uh, how she will say goodbye to us. And I wish you a good way back home. And uh, let's listen to Mrs. Uh, Beckowitz. And thanks to all our guests, Mr. Salmi, Mr. Stanuta, and everybody else for thank you for having been here thank you mrs uh, uh, Zamrotsky. Uh, ladies and gentlemen dear guests these hours were intensive that we spent together rich in uh, understanding finding they were touching emotional and this in a direct conversation here in Berlin and through digital channels. And at the same time, we were distributed across uh, many European uh, uh, countries. Many thanks to Mr. Stefanuta in Romania. Thank you very much for your active participation and the committed discussion. Thank you, Mr. Auer. That was very committed, the way in which you presented your views from your region. The tasks that lie ahead of us are great. We do not know how the pandemic will develop in the coming weeks. But what we know for sure is the virus uh, will not stop at borders, and particularly in your region. Europe must stick together as a European Union, but also as a continent as a whole. We have become aware that Europe uh, must also act globally in health matters. So something can start from here, but we must not only do it for ourselves, and that is what I have learned today. I think it is important uh, to always keep an eye on the practical level. For three decades now, I've been running a large uh, office for general medicine in a small Bavarian town in the middle of the countryside. In the Thus, uh, my team and uh, I, myself, uh, uh, we form the smallest link in a chain that ultimately extends to the WHO, the KBV Web Congress Resilient Health Systems 2020 has shown that uh, we have to uh, connect the experiences from all these levels. Only then we will really be able to tap the potential from the lessons learned. It is with deep conviction that I call on all member states of the European Union and all other European countries not to reduce their efforts in the development of their national healthcare system in close cooperation with all partners, of course. This is the only way in which we can cope with this pandemic with the least possible loss of human lives or patients uh, with serious health consequences and, if possible, without uh, any other collateral damage. I wish you all a good day and I hope that you will uh, pass on the impetus of today's uh, discussions. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen in the background uh, and those who are present here, uh, everybody who is here, and also many thanks to those who uh, ask us interesting questions in our chat and have a good and safe trip back home.